poppy, lightweight, nimble trail bike that punches well above its weight when things get rough. That's right, this is the Orbea Occam Ride Report. Before we dive into the video, I wanna let you know this video is sponsored by Jensen USA. Jensen is a leading online retailer of Orbea bicycles here in the United States, and I've got a link in that YouTube description below over to the Orbea Occam listing at Jensen USA. Anything you purchase from Jensen will directly help support this channel. bike parts in this episode, so I want to give you a heads up. I have a few other industry affiliations. I'm sponsored by P&W Components, Industry 9, Cali Protectives, Kitspo Cycling Apparel, and Shimano. Furthermore, I've got a really unique relationship with my longtime bike sponsor, Ibis Cycles. In 2020, I'm riding Ibis bikes in half my videos, and you can learn more about this arrangement in the video I did all about it right up here. A little while back in March, I posted a video about the Occam where I pulled out of the box and took it on the first ride and let you know some of my initial first impressions of the bike. I live here in beautiful Bellingham, Washington, which is a major riding destination in the Pacific Northwest. William of Occam was an English friar who lived from 1287 to 1347 AD. Now our pal Billy was once quoted as saying, Entities should not be multiplied without necessity. That's roughly translated into English as the simplest solution is ultimately the best. Orbea has taken that philosophy, they've wrapped it in carbon fiber, they've applied a one-sided brace from the seat tube to the down tube, they used a simple suspension design, and they put it together into the form of a bicycle. That bicycle is the Orbea Occam, a 140 travel trail bike. This is the first Orbea bicycle I've ever ridden, and I had a lot of fun learning about Orbea as a company. It was founded in 1840 by three Spanish brothers in the Basque region of Spain, and they made handguns and rifles until about 1926 when they took all that steel tubing and manufacturing experience and applied it to bicycles and baby carriages. If you want to know more about Orbea, check out last week's upload, The Story of Orbea. I'll link to it right up here in the YouTube card. I posted a full eight videos riding the Occam thus far, and you've all been giving me a ton of great questions about it. But by far, the two most common are, how does it compare to the Ibis bikes? And the other is, how is the suspension? Hang on and we'll answer both those questions and many more as we get into the video. A little bit of a confession, when I first put this bike together and took it out for a couple of rides, I honestly thought it was more of like a trail cross country bike and that I might be pushing it beyond its initial design intent. And that made me feel really terrible because the last thing I want to do as someone who has been so related to Ibis in particular over the last decade, is to take a bike from a respected manufacturer and then disrespect it by riding it in an environment for which it was never intended. I was really concerned about this. And then I saw the launch video for the Occam and then a follow-up launch video. I saw this guy hucking like a six or eight foot drop to flat. I saw this French guy doing a little wheelie. And then I saw these Enduro shredders on the Canary Islands just roosting the daylights out of the Occam, jumping it. I even saw a guy roost a tree with the Occam. That made me feel a lot better. I feel like this bike's intended for the kind of riding that I'm doing around here and that I'm not disrespecting it. The Occam is really at its best on natural single track trails. It's got a pretty steep seat tube angle at 77 degrees, which is really nice for those steeper climbs. Now, somewhat more importantly, the bike has kind of a steeper head tube angle. With the 36 150 fork, the bike's at a 66 degree head angle. That's slack enough that you're not gonna be nervous on the steeper trails, but it's not nearly as slack as some of the more enduro race-oriented bikes. That's a really good thing for these more natural trails. The slacker bikes, while they're super fun, they require you to handle the bike standing up out of the saddle, which takes a lot of energy. They also really enjoy fast, gnarly, man-made, bike park style trails. The slightly steeper head angle means that Occam is still quite nimble and poppy on flatter, mellower trails, which a lot of natural trails aren't just downhill tracks for hours and hours on end. The Occam's not an enduro race bike, but as an all around mountain bike, it's actually better than an enduro race bike in a lot of situations. The general kinematics of the design suit the original design intent very, very well. The frame is a single pivot design and there's an additional pivot concentric to the rear axle that drives the linkage that actuates the rear shock. 
I didn't notice any pedal kickback while pedaling through rough sections. Traction was really good with this setup, and in the tighter, slower portions of trail, if I did end up deeper into the travel, it never lost that playful, poppy feeling. To compare the suspension to the Ibis bikes, yes, it has a bit of a different feel. I would not buy one bike or the other based solely on the suspension design. The geometry and the overall package is more noticeable than just that single data point. There's also a, just a little bit more traction with the DW Link, which is both beneficial and detrimental depending on the situation. The DW Link bikes are a little bit more stuck to the ground, which means they're a little harder to get airborne than this design. On the Orbea, I felt like I could pop off of anything and get plenty of air. When pumping the Orbea down the trail, I could generate a lot of forward speeds by pushing down at the right time. You can hear this in some of my GoPro footage as I start pumping my way down the trails. Now when I started to hit trails that had actual man-made jumps, <laughs> the feel of the Occam was pretty good. Sort of. So it's really good at boosting and getting lots of air. That's kind of why the more natural trails, it's such a fun bike. You can easily pop off rocks and roots to clear trail chunder. At the bike park though, and on the man-made jumps, it's easy to go really high, but you don't have the quantity of travel and it's pretty easy to bottom this thing out. This bike's super fun, but I keep bottoming it out like none other on bike parky, jumpy things. The setup's more for trail riding, so I'm gonna dial it in for our local trail riding, which is like a little bit faster, jumpier than your average raw natural trail. That means volume reducers, front and rear. The bigger the volume reducer, the smaller the amount of air volume is available inside the shock, which means it's gonna be more progressive. That curve is gonna be steeper. It's gonna ramp up sooner. I think I'm gonna try a 0.8 right now, and that's almost as big as you can go on that DPX2 shot. There we go. There we go. I've talked about these air volume reducers a few times. They are such a good tuning tool and it's kind of why I don't have coil shocks on all my bikes. Slide this guy down. The stock part spec of the Occam was really well thought out with an incredible attention to detail. I ended up swapping a lot of the parts. I wanted it to feel like it was my own personal bike and I have quite a few preferences. Also, my single biggest complaint with the Occam is its torsional stiffness. Now, I'm riding here in Bellingham where we have a lot of man-made stuff and a lot of high-speed stuff, and that's where you're gonna notice the stiffness the most. With Ibis's Ritmo AF, I noticed that torsionally it's not as stiff as I'd like as well. Some people agree with me, some don't notice it, so this is not a huge deal for a whole lot of folks, but this is my report, and I'm gonna tell you what I noticed. So what did I do? I started swapping parts out with a goal to increase stiffness. On a shorter travel bike like this, 140 rear, 150 front, I feel like all the components, and especially the wheels, are gonna get hammered. If you have a longer travel bike and you're smashing through the same trail you would on this thing, all the parts on the shorter travel bike are gonna take more impact. The first thing I did was swap off the DT Swiss XMC 1200 carbon wheel set. That's a very fancy, very high-end wheel set, but it was not as stiff as I'd like. I could feel it moving back and forth when I was pumping in and out of corners. If I ever landed a jump sideways, I would feel guilty like I was gonna snap those wheels, and the last thing I wanted to do was break a $2,800 wheel set. So DT Swiss is one of the best hub and rim and even spoke manufacturers in the world. I'm sponsored by a company called Industry 9, and I've got great access to Industry 9 parts. I wanted something stiffer, so I went for an aluminum Industry 9 wheel set called the Enduro 305, and I chose that one because it uses a 30 millimeter inner width rim, plenty wide, aluminum, so it can take a hit and not break, and even more importantly, it uses the Industry 9 aluminum spoke system, which builds a very stiff wheel. Now, those Industry 9 wheels do weigh 300 grams more than the DT Swiss wheels but I'm not that concerned about it. I also swapped off the Maxxis XO trail casing tires for some big old honkers. If you've been watching my videos for a while, you know that I've been sponsored by WTB. I even used to work there. They were kind enough to supply me with tires for this bike and I chose tough casing 2.6 size tires. I used a Vigilante tough high grip up front, a Trail Boss tough fast rolling in the back. Each one of those tires is about 400 grams heavier than the Maxxis counterpart. 
So all that extra weight really helped make this bike feel a lot stiffer and burlier. And I really like that a lot, especially on the more man-made trail. The bike came back to the Crank Brothers 150 mil dropper post. It worked flawlessly. I had no problems with it. That said, on all my other bikes, I'm running 200 millimeters of drop. I swapped over to a PNW Components Bachelor 170 drop seat post, and I very much appreciated that extra 20 mils of clearance when hitting steeper trails, jumps, and even cornering. In 2020, I've ridden saddles from Chromag, Fabric, Physique, and WTB. My personal favorites are WTBs, and I also really like that Fabric saddle that came on the Intense Taser. The bike came with a Physique saddle that the shape didn't work that great for me, but the biggest issue I had with it was that it was too slippery. I would literally slide off the back of the saddle on mellow and especially on steeper climbs. The WTB and the Physique saddle that I like so much have a bit of a scoop to the back of them as well as a little more textured surface. So I swapped over to a WTB Pure saddle. To answer the most common question you've all had, the Occam basically falls between, in my opinion at least, the Ripley and the Ripmo. It has geometry that's very close to a Ripley but then it has suspension characteristics that are a lot closer to a Ripma. The Occam's chain stays are eight millimeter longer than those on the Ripley, and to me that actually felt really good. The way those chain stays are a little bit longer, it almost feels more predictable, and then when it comes up into a manual, it's almost like you have a bigger float range for balance. The Ripmo has a very different feel than the Occam. The Ripmo's wheelbase is 27 <laughs> millimeters longer. That's huge. The Ripmo requires a more out of the saddle riding technique and you're gonna need to lean the Ripmo more in corners. Whereas on the Occam, you'll keep it more upright and you'll steer with the handlebars a little bit more. The Ripmo really needs to go fast to really wake up. The Occam can have a lot of fun at 15 miles an hour, at 10 miles an hour. The Occam is not a slouch by any means, but it's a little bit more lively and fun on those less technical trails. No one ever talks about this, but being overbiked is a lot less fun than being underbiked. And if you're on mellower trails that probably aren't gonna bite you too bad, I like being on smaller bikes. Most people ride natural trails by far the most, and they make a few bike park trips a year. The Occam would be great for that setup. It can handle the bike park days, especially with that bigger fork but you're not gonna feel overbiked the rest of the year. Take a quick minute and hit that link below over to Jensen USA. Check out the various models of the Occam. There's a budget price point version for just under 3,000 bucks. I was looking through the various models and I noticed that the M10 version seemed like a very good value. It's only 1,500 bucks more than the M30, but upgraded. You get a carbon fiber frame, which chances are is actually stiffer than the alloy one. You get a 36 fork up front and you get the DPX2 rear shock. I have that bike linked below as well. Let's give a huge shout out to Jensen USA for supporting all these different bikes on my channel in 2020. Thus far, I've ridden an intense Taser e-bike, a Chromeg Stylus hardtail, and the Orbea Aka. Let me know what you guys wanna see next. Thank you all for watching this and talking bikes. It's been a pleasure. Hit that red subscribe button below that'll help all of us out a ton. I'll see you guys on the trails.